Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's special lecture hosted by Francis Tavern Museum and the Alexander Hamilton Awareness Society. In this presentation, Sergio Via Venencio, Vice President of the Alexander Hamilton Awareness Society, will delve into the early relationship between the United States and St. Eustatius, which critically supplied the Patriots' cause by smuggling the necessary goods to keep the American Revolution going, and how the island's fate years later decisively affected the end of the Revolutionary War. Sergio is also chair of the New York City Semi-Quincentennial Committee, project coordinator for the New York Council of Histories, Education, New York City Region, and a content engagement and diversity and inclusion consultant, as well as an advisory council member of the National Parks Conservation Association, the Northeast Region. As always, please ask questions in the Q&A during the lecture. You can leave those in the Q&A box. It's also as in the chat box as well. We will be monitoring those for after the lecture. And now I'd like to present Sergio to our virtual lectern. Well, thank you so much for having me. One thing that naturally occurs as time goes by and decades and centuries pass is the oversimplification of history. The oversimplification of history events when it comes to forming a narrative, highly complex events eventually become uh, reduced to main, mainly to data, particularly when it comes to history education. Remember the names, check. Remember the dates, check, check. Remember the winner, check. And if you're able to remember it all correctly, you will probably have really great marks in your history class at school. Unfortunately, the oversimplification of history does very little to stimulate our curiosity and even less to produce a need for research that goes beyond the existing research or established narrative and data. With time, Naturally, narratives accommodate to the angle of who's telling the story and some key players or key events that can provide extraordinary background and crucial information get eventually left behind and forgotten. It's a little bit like when a book becomes a movie. So what I would like to do today is to take a step back and enhance our angle of perspective and examine the role that the Dutch island of St. Eustatius played during the Revolutionary War and how the island's fate years later decisively affected the outcome of the siege of Yorktown and therefore the American Revolution. So um, let us talk a little bit about St. Eustatius and its rich history. St. Eustatius, also called Eustatia, is a special mun municipality within the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Its capital is Oranjestad, and it is five miles northwest of the island of St. Kitts and Nevis. The island of St. Kitts, uh, sorry, the country of St. Kitts and Nevis is, uh, particularly Nevis, is very special to me for a reason that uh, you probably know. Alexander Hamilton was born in the island of Nevis. Stasia is particularly small. It is six miles long and three miles wide and it is dominated by the presence of a majestic volcano called the Quill. It's such an incredible place to visit and I encourage all of you to visit at one point. It is unclear if Estasia was inhabited prior to the arrival of the European colonizers. However, this small island was so important in its strategic uh, position that between the 1600s and the early 1800s, it's changed hands 21 times between the Dutch, the English, and the French. Let me show you a little bit of it. Um, okay, this is the island of St. Eustatius. As you can see, um, this is the east, this is the west, and uh, you have the beautiful volcano that I was talking about. It's um, one thing that you're gonna notice about this island is that the vegetation is completely different on both sides of the island. And that is because of the wind. When the wind is so strong in the east, you have vegetation that is really low. And on the left, that is a lot calmer, you find high uh, palm trees and a lot of higher trees. In the 1800, despite the shortage of fresh water and the absence of a good natural harbor, uh, St. Eustatius neutrality and its condition as a free trade port where you did not have to pay any custom duties, uh, had turned the island into a major mercantile uh, point in the Caribbean. By 1776, St. Eustatius was a vital supplier of goods to the rebellious colonies in mainland North America. It provided the Continental Army with the much necessary supplies to carry 
on with a revolutionary war, such as gunpowder, munitions, uh, weapons, guns, materials for rigging ships, and many other military supplies. But also much more basic goods, such as uh, olive oil, clothing, eatables, things like that. While this trading was going on, the Continental Congress passed a bill called Instructions to the Commanders of Private Ships or Vessels of War will shall have commissions to, um, of letters of mark and reprisal authorizing them to take capture of British vessels and cargoes. And this is the, the bill. The bill that pretty much authorized any citizen with a ship to become a privateer. And this becomes absolutely fascinating. This bill encouraged citizens to equip any vessel with the purpose of attacking, destroying, capturing, and bringing back to port any British vessel that they may find in their way. Now, let us remember uh, that not all of the population in what later became the United States was in rebellion. Some parts of the colonies were still loyal to the crown. So it was a quite complicated thing. Smuggling became a sort of a patriotic duty. And at the same time, uh, the British were trying, that were trying to stop that, uh, the privateers that you know, were enabled to, to, to be so by, by the Continental Congress were also trying to stop any uh, mercantile vessels from coming uh, from Britain. Realistically, the Continental Navy with the only 20 warships that were commissioned by them were not able at all in their dreams to properly face or even defeat the 500 military vessels that the Royal British Navy had. Uh, and here is, is, this is a place where this bill becomes so important because uh, by Congress allowing the citizens to become privateers, a more balanced presence on the sea becomes uh, more and more evident. Uh, now, the privateers did not focus on attacking the British military vessels, per se, because it was not going to be a fair fight, obviously. But they concentrated mainly on making life impossible for any British merchant ships. Now, although the Navy was to play only a minor role in the war, the success of the American privateers in interrupting British trade was an important factor aiding the Patriot cause. The privateers then thus uh, served two purposes. One was to steal goods and supply the Continental Army. And also they ended up bankrupting a lot of the wealthy British merchants that saw their cargoes either seized or destroyed. Now, I'm sure many of you never heard about that bill. And it, 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 it's such a, it's such an incredible bill. There were more than 1,700 letters of mark and reprisal, uh, which were issued, and close to 2,500 ships, with more than 70,000 men serving on board, participated as privateers. Incredible. But military supplies were never sent via merchant vessels. They were sent with warships, because they had to be properly protected. And this is where Sintio Statius became so important for, the, for what later became the United States. Sintio Statius was willing to sell arms, munitions, and gunpowder to the Continental Army in spite of being neutral. The Dutch were technically neutral. However, when it came to trading, they were not. Sintio Statius was then the most secure and effective route for transporting supplies that were not to be intercepted by the British. To the point that Thomas Jefferson, and this is a very interesting anecdote, specifically instructed for his uh, mail to be sent through Cynthia Stations. Such was the relationship between Cynthia Stations and the rebellious colonies that a few months after the colonies declared its independence, a copy of the Declaration of Independence was sent to Cynthia Stations on board the Andrew Doria. The Andrew Doria was a 14-gun frigate. This is a, an image of the Andrew Doria approaching uh, Sindhu Stations. You can see the beautiful volcano uh, on the background. And there was another 
copy of the Declaration of Independence was actually sent to the Netherlands, but it was intercepted and never made it there. Uh, so this uh, vessel, the Andrew Doria, uh, it was bearing the flag of the newly formed United States of America. And upon arrival to the shores of St. Eustatius on November 16, uh, 1776, Captain Isaiah Robinson announced its arrival with a 13 gunshot salute. And why 13? It was one for each one of the 13 colonies in rebellion against the British crown. It was one for each one of the newly, newly formed states of the United States of America. Now from St. Eustatius, Governor Johannes de Graaf, he replied with 11 gunshots. That was his salute. Now, why is this important? Why the number of shots were, were important? Uh, because the international protocol required two gunshots fewer than the original salute to acknowledge a sovereign flag. And this is the number of shots shot from Orania, uh, Fort Orania, 11, in response to the 13 gunshots from the Andrew Doria. Now, St. Eustatius became the first foreign government to officially recognize the continental colors and the sovereignty of the United States of America. With time, the event of uh, November 16, 1776 has become known as the First Salute. There is a, a wonderful book by uh, Barbara Tuckman that you can find. It's also called The First Salute. So um, look for it on your favorite bookshop. And um, this is a very meaningful date to hold this presentation because today is November 16. And today is the 245th anniversary of the first salute, the first acknowledgement by a foreign government of the United States of America. It is also important to mention that in St. Eustatius, uh, this day, November 16, is celebrated and commemorated as Stacia Day in commemoration of the first salute, first salute. So I would like to say happy Stacia date to any stations who may be watching this presentation. I know for sure that there is one or two doing that. If you were to visit Fort, or Fort Orange, you wouldn't be able to miss the impressive flagpole in the middle of the courtyard. This is a fort of uh, Fort Orange. Now, uh, Stacia with the years have uh, suffered a lot from erosion. So there are only four bast three bastions left from the original three ones. And this is the flagpole that I was talking about. Um, and this is the plaque that, that I was talking about that is at the, oh, sorry, I did not talk about it yet. But at the bottom of that flagpole, there is a plaque uh, and this is myself with uh, Thomas Oller, Dr. Thomas Oller, and um, Mariana Oller uh, is vice chair and chair of the Alexander Hamilton Awareness Society. The board of uh, the Alexander Hamilton Awareness Society made a visit to St. Eustatius after an impressive discovery that I will be mentioning a little bit later. Now, you must be wondering what is this plaque in the middle? And um, this plaque is a plaque that was, um, well, let me tell you first, what does the plaque say? The plaque say, uh, and I have to read it because I don't know it by heart, but here it says, in commemoration of the salute to the flag of the United States fired in this fort on 16 November, 1776, by orders of Johannes de Graaf, Governor of St. Eustatius, in reply to a national gun salute fired by the United States Brig of War Andrew Doria under Captain Isaiah Robinson of the Continental Navy, here the sovereignty of the United States of America was first formally acknowledged to a national vessel by a foreign official. And guess who presented this plaque? This plaque was presented by Frank Del Franklin Delano Roosevelt, President of the United States of America. Now, this, uh, this plaque was presented in 1939. And uh, it is very important for me to mention something that is really cool. Um, some members of the Roosevelt family, his ancestors, 
were actually living in East Asia at the time in which the first salute actually happened. So imagine how amazing it must have been for him to actually come to East Asia and present that plaque in commemoration of something that happened when his family was uh, living there. Now, obviously, uh, when the first salute took place, uh, the British did not like it at all. Not one bit. No, no. Um, Great Britain took umbrage at the incident and lodged a complaint with the hack in early 1777. As Eustatius was, of course, uh, considered to be speaking for the Netherlands in the matter. Now, in 1778, um, a politician, a member of parliament, Lord uh, Stormont, made the claim during a parliament session that if St. Eustatius had sunk into the sea three years before, the United Kingdom would have already dealt with George Washington. That's how important St. Eustatius was. To, to the Continental Army, to the patriotic cause, to, to, to the Revolutionary War in general. Uh, but things were about to get even worse for the British. On February 6th of 1778, um, Benjamin Franklin was in France signing the Treaty of Alliance, which made uh, the United States and France allies against Great Britain in the Revolutionary War. And what happened next? February 1778, France declares war on Britain, and this is immediately followed by Spain declaring war on Great Britain on June 21 of 1779. Now here things were quite complicated for the British, and we need to take yet another further step back uh, to gain further perspective. Well, for us here in the United States, this was a war of independence. And that's how we know it. That's how we perceive it. It was a revolutionary war. It was us plus the French versus the British um, and so on. Uh, for the British and other players in, in this war, it was a war of a global scale. And there were a, a, a few things that are happening here. Uh, Towards the last years of the Revolutionary War, the islands that were under the control of these European powers start to change hands. Things start to change, the islands start to change hands, priorities start to, 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 to change, and, and I'll get to that a little bit later. But then, uh, number two, the British are faced with strategic decisions, where to focus their resources. As I said before, the British were fighting a global war. They were fighting in the Gulf of Mexico. They were fighting in India. They were fighting in Europe. They were fighting in Africa. They were uh, fighting in the Caribbean. Uh, so what was more important for them to protect? And by this time, the French, remember that I said that some of the islands start changing hands. The French had already taken all the sugar islands, or most of them. And while the 13 colonies were really important, ensuring property of the money-making islands was definitely a lot more important. And that brings me to number three, which was priorities. The priorities have started to change. On June 1778, you see that General uh, Clinton is ordered to leave Philadelphia. Most of the army, as most of you may know, goes to New York, but thousands thousands of that army actually end up going south to Georgia, to Florida, and to the Caribbean. Those places needed in, uh, reinforce, reinforcement. And uh, we will start to see how the British start sending more and more soldiers to the Caribbean. The reinforced focus on the Caribbean means that Great Britain will no longer let things slide. In December 1780, frustrated by the trading relationships between Amsterdam and the French, uh, and also St. Eustatius and the, and the US, Great Britain declared war on the neutral Dutch. First order of business, St. Eustatius. The British had to stop St. Eustatius, and I'm going to show you who was the guy to do that, and this is Admiral Rodney. Well, let me tell you a little bit about Admiral Rodney. Uh, his name was George Bridges uh, Rodney. He was an English admiral who won several important naval battles against the French, against the Spanish, and against the Dutch. 
he was now appointed to be the commander of the battle fleet that was going to capture and take out Sintiostasius, prevent them from, be, from being anymore the powerful trading center that it was. So on February 3rd, uh, 1781, just a few months after the, the, the war is declared uh, to the Dutch, uh, the massive fleet of 15 ships and numerous smaller um, ships, I, I know for a fact that there were 21 really uh, stronger ships, uh, tra transporting more than 3,000 soldiers appeared before St. Eustatius and they were prepared to invade. Now, Governor de Graaf did not know about the declaration of war. It was completely out of the blue and he was overwhelmed. Uh, he had probably 60 cannons, uh, sorry, uh, less than 100 cannons, and uh, Rodney had several, several hundred cannons. Uh, there was a, the Graf surrendered without any bloodshed, but um, he actually fired two shots because of honor. And uh, after capturing Sintustatius, Admiral Rodney abandoned every other plans uh, or any other orders that he had and simply stayed in St. Eustatius to plan their own pillage. Why? Um, St. Eustatius had grown rich, extremely rich. The British took what they wished, but remained cautious um, in, in, in despoiling the merchants of the strong enemy powers, such as the French and the Spanish. The British were very careful with this. They knew that they Conquer Stasia today, and tomorrow the French could take an English mm -hmm. island as well. So the British mm -hmm. understood that they, what they could do to the French Americans on Stasia today, also the French could do to them tomorrow. So they were greedy, but they were smart and they were careful. However, there was a large group of very, very prosperous merchants that were on the island. And while Admiral Rodney knew that he was technically free to do to them whatever he wanted because they were not going to, there were not going to be any kind of repercussions. And I'm talking about the Jews. The Jews were citizens of nowhere. They were very prominent in single stations, but they had no army, they had no navy to defend them. And reportedly, Rodney had a very special hatred for the Jews. The very first merchants that Rodney rounded up and took possessions from with a special harsh treatment were the Jews of Station. Now, um, the one thing that you will find very interesting whenever you're researching the history of uh, the Caribbean is that you will see a particular trend. Throughout the time, you will see that at periods of time, some of the islands become more prominent than others. Some of the islands become more wealthy than others. They take turns as being the, the, the jewel, um, the, the crown jewel of the Caribbean, uh, if, you, if, if you will. And usually this prosperity and wealth goes hand in hand with the Jewish presence, presence in the island. Um, whatever the, the Jewish people arrive, it flourishes, but once they leave, things change. The Jews were very important for trade and they had a very huge uh, network for trading, which encompassed Africa, Europe, South America, the Caribbean and North America. So yes, um, Stasia was very rich. It was so rich that it was nicknamed the Golden Rock. At one point, uh, records indicate of several hundreds of ships harboring Stasia in, this, in the same day. It, it almost sounds incredible, but that's exactly what it was. It was absolutely um, full of trade. Now, contraband is, and trade of goods was not the only thing that made Stasia rich. Um, Stasia had, had also become one of the main trading points for enslaved individuals. In fact, many enslaved people lived in a station throughout, throughout this time. The wealth of St. Eustatius was not only built on the shoulders of skillful traders, but also on the backs of the enslaved population of St. Eustatius and the ones who passed through St. Eustatius 
uh, as part of the uh, trade of, of enslaved individuals. In Sindhu stations, a large part of the enslaved population did not work in sugar, but route between the ships and shore and transported goods from lower town to upper town. The thing is that Sindhu stations had a huge cliff. And at the bottom of this cliff was what was known as the lower town and above the cliff was called as a uh, upper town. And um, in order to take the goods, you had to climb the cliff. Um, I've been there, I've walked it, and trust me, it's not an easy thing to do. So I cannot imagine how it was for people having, having to, to deal with all the uh, merchandise and everything that they had to carry uh, back and forth all the way till the top of the cliff. Now, uh, nowadays, the lower town is basically not longer there. There are ruins, there is a small portion of the island, but Sindhu Stations, as I was mentioning earlier, has suffered erosion for decades. And even then, I'm talking about the, the 1700s, uh, there are records that indicate that after a huge downpour of uh, rain, uh, parts of the cliff collapsed, uh, bringing a chunk of the city down. Uh, making millions of dollars in financial damage. So it's not something new. Uh, the, the island has been physically changing for a while. Astasia was such a powerhouse that even after Rodney eliminated the island as a trading center, some con commemorative uh, coins were made to commemorate that Rodney actually captured Stasia. This is the side of, of one of them. That, that's Ronnie, by the way. This is the other side of the coin. You can read Rodney forever. And you can see uh, some of the ships in there. This is absolutely fascinating. And this is another one of the coins. St. Justatia, Saba, and St. Martins. And uh, it, it's absolutely incredible to see these commemorative coins. And this commemorative commemorative coins are part of the collection of a very renowned historian from Stasia, Mr. Walter Hellebrand. Walter Hellebrand is a former head of communications and uh, PR of uh, BBC Worldwide and the former director of monuments at the Sintu Stasia's Monuments Foundation. Uh, he's watching this presentation all the way from Amsterdam, so I want to say hi, Walter. And, <laughs> and I also would like to mention two other historians who have done extensive research regarding the Caribbean. One of them is, of course, uh, Michael E. Newton. He's an Alexander Hamilton scholar. And uh, also I would like to mention park ranger Russell Brindley. Um, since we're mentioning uh, Michael Newton and Walter Hellerand, I want to make a little parenthesis in the relationship between Cynthia Stages and the Revolutionary War to mention something that hits a lot closer to home for me, particularly as Vice President of the Alexander Hamilton Awareness Society. A few years ago, a couple of years ago, um, Michael E. Newton, who has been pretty much the person making every single new discovery you find about um, Alexander Hamilton's early life, uh, found records, well, he, he found these, uh, uh, legal, I'm forgetting the word right now, I'm sorry. Um, uh, legal deposition in which Alexander Hamilton himself is talking about his age, uh, his religion, uh, several things regarding himself. And uh, there are other people also um, whose documents he found that situated Alexander Hamilton and his family in the island of St. Eustatius. Now, this was mind blowing because at the time, all we knew was that Hamilton lived in Nevis and then he went to St. Croix and from St. Croix, he went to the United States and uh, ended up in New Jersey for a little bit and then in New York. But, um, but no, suddenly we had a new island in the mix and it was in the stations. And then Walter, Walter Hellebrand uh, was the one who, started to find these uh, the, the records of the census records that put Alexander Hamilton and his family uh, in St. Eustatius. Uh, and then uh, the more records were found, the more we realized that uh, the Hamiltons were actually in St. Eustatius way longer than we thought. 
and it's absolutely incredible. And I'm not gonna get into detail for that because otherwise it's gonna be one more hour to this talk. However, I just wanna mention something that is really cool. Why is Indiustatius? Indiustatius was, um, was a great place to be for anybody who was willing to take risks and make their fortune. And as some of you may know, um, the father of Alexander Hamilton was not the eldest son of his father. And the way things were was that the eldest son would inherit everything and then the other ones will have to find a way to make their fortune. That's the reason why James Hamilton uh, went to the Caribbean from Scotland. And um, it is only natural when you really understand the, the, the process of, of how the, the behavior of the islands were at the time that he would uh, eventually try to find his fortune in, in, in the Caribbean, sorry, in, in, in St. Eustatius. But let's go back to Rodney. And um, securing St. Eustatius was not the only job, but before I continue, those who want to know more about uh, Alexander Hamilton's early life in the Caribbean, please look for the uh, books of uh, Michael E. Newton, particularly the latest one called Discovering Hamilton. He also has a blog that is really good, has all this information. Now back to Rodney. Securing Cindy Stations was not the only job that Admiral Rodney had. Cornwallis, the British commander at Yorktown, had confidently expected the arrival of Rodney's fleet from the British Caribbean all the way to Yorktown. Now imagine this for a second. You're confident, confidently knowing that someone's going to come to reinforce you, to resupply you, to bring a lot of ships and military power, and that didn't exactly happen the way he was expecting. Now, many people uh, know exactly what happened during the siege of Yorktown, how Rochambeau and Washington came from New York and together with the Marquis de Lafayette and Alexander Hamilton, um, forced the surrender of Lord Cornwallis, who was not able to receive reinforcements of the British because of the French fleet blocking the Chesapeake Bay. Without French, without French, the outcome would have probably been very much different, not to say disastrous. Uh, but what would have happened if Admiral Rodney, instead of staying in St. Eustatius, out of greed, uh, actually decided to go up and reinforce Cornwallis like Cornwallis was expecting him to do. Rodney knew that if he redirected his resources to, you know, face engage the, 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 the French, um, he would have to separate himself from Stacia and Stacia was too much of a rich treasure for Rodney to walk away from. Now, Rodney was not a wealthy man, but if you do a little bit research that I'm, I'm sure uh, all of you will start looking into this later, uh, you will see that at this point, as, as Rodney starts pillaging and plundering St. Eustatius, he starts to line his pockets with money and, 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 and valuables. And he also starts to send some adventurous and, and, and very big claim uh, letters to, to England and, and the people he knows. He starts sending a letter to his daughter, promising research, uh, sorry, riches, start letting a, a, sending a, a letter also promising to, to pay for a wedding and to take care of expenses and to buy property. So, so pretty much even before he made it to England, he was already convinced that he was already a rich man. And the longer he stayed in Stacia, the more he money he kept on, on, on making. And, uh, he calculated what would happen if he stayed in stations, in St. Eustatius, sorry. He calculated what would happen if he continued uh, robbing every ship that entered the waters for months. As a matter of fact, what Rodney did was that he continued to fly the Dutch flag on the pole, luring any, any ship uh, that was, uh, you know, to, to come over just for that purpose. And by this time, uh, the French fleet actually headed north, uh, beating Rodney to it. Now, this was uh, Admiral uh, de Grasse, sorry. Uh, General Cornwallis awaited desperately, he needed reinforcements and supplies, but nothing came down the York River. And um, 
you, you can put yourself in his shoes and try to, him looking into the horizon of the ocean, trying to see if there were any pretty ships coming either from New York or from the Caribbean uh, to, to, you know, to bring relief, but none of them made it in time. And for a tantalizing three whole months, the French Navy, not the British, were the most powerful in the North Atlantic. The French Caribbean fleet had slipped away, joining with another French fleet coming south. By the time that Rodney realized what, is ha what was happening, it was too late. He was already weakened. Guess what he did before this happened? Well, guess what he had done? He had sent part of his fleet back to England, completely filled up and loaded with pillaged treasures from Cynthia stations. Now, uh, on top of the the cargo that he sent, he had to send a couple more to protect the cargo. So his fleet was absolutely weakened. Now, when Rodney realized what was going on with the French, that, that they were heading towards uh, Virginia, he sent ships uh, up north, uh, but it was a different fleet, which actually faced uh, the grass in the Chesapeake. It was a fleet led by Rear Admiral uh, Sir Thomas Graves, this battle became known as the Battle of the Capes. It was a battle that was disastrous for the British because they were not able to get cl any close to Cornwallis to uh, reinforce or rescue him. Now, hold without any hope of resupply or assistance, uh, Cornwallis surrendered, putting an end to the last major land battle in the Revolutionary War. What can we get from this? It was Rodney's, a lot of people can agree that it was Rodney's greed and his hatred for the Jews that costed the British the siege of Yorktown, if you really look at it from a certain angle. So uh, what happened later? Um, Admiral Rodney actually, um, oh my goodness, I'm forgetting the word here. Um, I forgot the word. Admiral Rodney um, saved face later with something that he did. And he actually faced uh, the, 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 the French and the, and the Spaniards uh, in the Battle of the Saints. Uh, and, and what happened here as, was that Rodney actually obliterated, destroyed the French. Now, why is this so relevant? First of all, because he became a prominent person again, uh, as you can imagine, after all this news of him doing the pillaging and plundering were not so good for his image. Uh, also, the little fiasco with Yorktown was also not so good for his, for his image, even though there are a lot of people and historians who think that he was just following intelligence and did not, uh, didn't know what was going to happen, etc. I completely disagree with that. But, the Battle of the Saints, what it really did with it is that it, by taking out the, the French Navy, uh, it, gave, it gave the British a really strong hand at the negotiation table when the Treaty of Paris was negotiated later. And, uh, and this is really fascinating because out of the uh, Treaty of Paris, you see, you remember how I told you that at the beginning, sort of towards the end of the Revolutionary War, these islands start changing hands. What happened was that with Britain having such a strong hand after, during the negotiation of the Treaty of Paris, the islands sort of start going back to the original uh, powers that had them. Now, after Cornwallis, sorry, after Cornwallis had taken St. Eustatius, uh, the French came and took St. Eustatius from the British. Now, what happened here was that they took the they 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 took Cindy Stations from, from the British, but they didn't take it for themselves. They gave it back to the Dutch after the Treaty of Paris, and, and things started to get back to normal. However, um, Cindy Stations sort of recovered a little bit, and and uh, I'm going to get a little bit into what happened later for every single key player of of, of this thing. What happened to Cindy Stations later is that um, once you know it was given back to the Dutch, they already started to recover slowly. 
um, as a matter of fact, uh, Walter was telling me recently that some of the most uh, valuable uh, tombstones made of marble in, in East Asia are actually from the 1790s, which was after um, you know all the plundering and pillaging of, of, of St. Eustatius by, by Rodney. However, during the Napoleonic uh, Wars, the French actually came back to St. Eustatius and this time they took it back for themselves. And what happened here was that they considered Symbiosatius to be way too rich. They started to tax it extremely high. Um, they started to divert all the commercial routes towards their own um, islands, the French islands. And um, the United States at this, at this point had already created its own commercial network. Um, South America, particularly the, the East with uh, Portugal, sorry, with Brazil had already established its own commercial networks and St. Eustatius was no longer an uh, obligatory stopping point uh, for this. So that's what happened. Eventually, St. Eustatius started to decline and it never really recovered financially. And one thing that is fascinating about St. Eustatius is that it, it hasn't been touched really uh, by modern uh, changes. And, and I'm talking here is that when you go there, you're not gonna find you know, the, the 29 uh, floor hotel and things that block your view. It's very easy to be there and imagine exactly how everything looked, what route did people take by walking. It's, it's a very particular experience. And again, uh, if you have a chance to go back to city stations, please do. What happened to the graph, the governor that uh, surrendered uh, St. Eustatius? Well, um, he had, uh, he was a very wealthy person, had a mass immense power. It was in all his best interest to continue doing um, trading with the United States. And um, after the British made these complaints in The Hague, uh, he was recalled to the Netherlands, but he was also um, sent back after he made explanations of why he was doing what he was doing. Um, who am I missing? Cornwallis. Cornwallis ended up going to India. He became the, um, the general governor of India, if I'm not wrong. And he changed um, a nemesis for another nemesis. It was no longer George Washington, but now it was Tipu Sultan. And with this, I want to um, Mention also another historian, uh, Angelina Fielding. She's doing incredible research on Tipu Sultan and um, a, a fantastic book right now on George Washington and Tipu Sultan, which I'm, I'm sure is going to be extraordinary. Now, Cornwallis, uh, as I told you, he ended up in India and he's still in India because his tomb is in Uttar Pradesh in, in India. He never, uh, he was not uh, back in the United Kingdom. Uh, what happened to Alexander Hamilton after becoming a hero of Yorktown? He actually went ahead and became the Secretary of the Treasury, did extraordinary legal precedence as a lawyer and worked tirelessly to secure the, um, the flourishment of the United States as a nation. Um, what, what happened to Am I missing anybody? What happened to the people of St. Eustatius? What happened to the people of St. Eustatius? Thank you so much for the excellent question because that's exactly <laughs> where I was going. So you remember that I mentioned that um, uh, Rodney had a special hatred towards the Jewish population. One thing that he did, and this was really nasty, he kept them in warehouses uh, with, with, uh, for a while without proper uh, food or water. And then out of the blue, he started to ship um, the head of the Jewish families to other islands without letting their families know where they were going. He was trying to separate them completely and to create a psychological havoc in the families. Uh, some of the uh, Jewish families left uh, St. Eustatius eventually, and uh, some didn't. But as I said earlier, um, as much as the island looked like it was starting to recover financially, it never got to do so. And um, after the, the commercial routes and networks started changing and the French 
put such a high tax on them and redirected any flux of trading to the French islands, uh, simply stations, uh, started a decline um, that uh, never really recovered. Uh, it's a wonderful place. Uh, I have been there uh, with the board of the Alexander Hamilton Awareness Society and um, the descendants of all the people who live throughout all of this are still there and they're uh, wonderful people that um, are very proud of their history and continue to, to have a, a, a wonderful life in the, in the place of their ancestors. So um, with that, I would like to thank you again for uh, having me here. Thank you. You're welcome. That was so, I mean, thank you. That was wonderful. I was like feverishly writing down notes and all the things that I didn't know before. So it's always a pleasure. We've had a few great questions come in. Um, I want to follow up with all of the forcibly displaced people on the island. So you had mentioned earlier about being able to trace more of Hamilton's family throughout the islands. Has there been any extra genealogical work done to help kind of retrace those steps as people were kind of forcibly removed from their homes after the war? Are you talking about the Jewish population? Yes, for the Jewish population. population. Well, one, one thing that I know is that a lot of them were sent to, um, so this was very interesting and you can see the mindset of, of Rodney. Nevis, which was again, uh, very close to station. You have no idea, check a map, you'll see how close they are. <laughs> uh, Nevis, um, St. Kitts, and then Stasia, right uh, on the Northwest. Uh, you're going to see that at the time, Nevis was also flourishing with a lot of Jewish presence, but St. Kitts had barely known. So what Rodney do was he sent all these Jewish people that he was separating from his families, to St. Kitts, not to Nevis, a place where they would get some sort of support, but to St. Kitts where there was nothing for them, nowhere for them. So um, eventually they started to move throughout the Caribbean and uh, I am not aware of any genealogical uh, studies uh, about that, but uh, you, you can see, the more you study the history of the Caribbean, you're going to see that, that you know, that, that is also the history of the Jewish population. It's, it's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, Frank asks, is the volcano active? Which was also a question I was thinking about when you showed us the map. Well, it wasn't when I was there. <laughs> and I, don't think it, I don't think it is because you can have beautiful tours to go down. There is a beautiful ecosystem in, inside the volcano in the crater. Mm -hmm. So I would like to, if I tell you that I know exactly when was the last time it erupted, but no, I, it's, it's pretty safe. And given the size of the island, if anything was to happen with that volcano, a lot of islands close by would be gone too. Uh, yeah, yep. so I don't, I, don't <laughs> think, I don't think it is active at all, yes. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what happened to Rodney and Cornwallis right after the war? I mean, it seems like the war ended and they all kind of went on their separate ways to be commanders in other different places, but did Cornwallis ever kind of reprimand him in any different way? I'm so sorry, cut a little bit. Could you please? Uh, oh, yeah. Um, did uh, Cornwallis reprimand Rodney in any way after the war? Because it seems like they just went on their own separate ways, doing their I, own thing. I am not aware of that. I am not aware of that. And if, if possible, I believe that um, Walter may be making a comment in the chat. So if, if possible, I would like to uh, take a look at that. Yeah, Walter's been great. Yes. Oh, here it says, so actually the band Jews petitioned Rodney to be allowed to return and he allowed it. So they did return to Cynthia Stations. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah. Sorry. Um, Oh, no, no, no. Uh, so Colin is asking, can you tell us something about the on land and underwater archaeologically archaeology currently going on around Stacia? Do you know anything about it? I do not, but I know that there have been some, uh, there is currently uh, excavations going on, on some um, uh, burials of uh, 
enslaved individuals. It's a, it's a very big discovery and they are doing these excavations even now. I think it started probably a year ago. Mm-hmm. So keep an eye on that because uh, it's, it's very interesting too. Cool. Um, I was curious when you were talking about the, so, yeah. Sorry, I, I see in the, in the chat that we were yeah. talking about how, how, how easy it is to get to, to, um, to the island of Stasia and, and Walter says that it's an 18 minute uh, hop from St. Martin. Someone made a comment that is like fairly easy since, since it's so close to Nevis and St. Kitts. Actually, it's not. You will not believe how rough the ocean between St. Kitts and Stasia is. It's such a close distance. It's very small, but it is, it is, it is, it is very rough. Actually, um, one of the stories that the locals were telling us is that you always go through the same because you can see the island from, from you can see the other island from where you are. So you usually see the ship coming and then you see the ship completely disappearing. And then you see it appearing again. And that's because of the size of the waves and how rough it can get. So yeah, um, when, wow. we, when we visited, when we visited um, St. Eustatius, uh, part of the, the AHA Society board and, and myself included in there, um, we visited at first, we were in the island of, of Nevis because we were visiting the Nevis uh, Historical and Con- Conservation Society. We were visiting, um, uh, some of the um, great work that they have been doing in the Hampton Trot House. And uh, we took a ship, well, it was more of a boat than a ship. It was a very small one. <laughs> uh, we took from uh, from the north side of St. Kitts all the way to St. Eustatius, and I can tell you it was really bad. So yeah, it is a short trip, if you want to say it that way, but it was not easy at all. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, it sounds like it takes longer to get from Francis Tavern to Staten Island on the ferry than it does to, to do this island topic. I think that that is a full like half hour. So I'm trying to figure out distance in my head. And that's the only kind of ferry that I've got like a touchstone on. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. Um, so since you've mentioned like the global perspective in the lecture of how it was not just about the colonies, this was a full global war, there were so many big powers going on. Um, how is the American Revolution perceived or taught about globally? Well, this is a very interesting question. And some of you are going to be extremely disappointed to know that in a lot of places around the world, the American Revolution is taught as a footnote to the French Revolution. And uh, now you can ask why, and I can give you my, my idea of why. Um, and this is something that I had a very passionate discussion with um, uh, Johanna Young Poor, um, who is a uh, or- Orange County historian. She's watching. Hi, Johanna. Um, it, it's a lot easier to romanticize the French Revolution, and I'll tell you why. Uh, when you compare both of them, there are certain things that uh, make it possible. Number one, the French actually exported their slavery to the colonies, as opposed to having it in, in, in France in the same scale that other places have. Um, number two, the French Revolution was a revolution that was bottom to top. The American Revolution was a revolution that was top to bottom. So when you have elements like that, it's very easy for a lot of people to romanticize uh, one revolution a lot more than other. And um, unfortunately, in, in spite of the American Revolution being the, you know, the source of all the other revolutions during the age of revolution, and this is something that is very important for people to understand. Everything started in the United States. Um, there have been times in which I was uh, you know, engaging with, with, with people who were not born in the United States. So they were not necessarily interested in, in this. And when I told them about the history of the Revolutionary War and how it affected all the many other different countries, you know, in their own process of, of, of revolution and independence, you know, then you see people getting much more interested and not only in the history of the United States, but also in their own history of their own countries. But again, um, that, that is unfortunately how it is taught. It's a footnote to the French Revolution. This was a glorious French Revolution. And by the way, this thing happened there as well. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, it's definitely interesting to talk even to some of my Canadian relatives about how it's taught. And I'm like, okay, well, this is what I do for a living. So I'm glad that sometimes I can be a footnote. (laughs) Feels great. Um, I would like to say thank you to Michael and Walter as well, because they have been so wonderful in the chat, answering everybody's questions as your lecture was coming in, that they've kind of answered everybody's questions. Um, The last one that I'm going to ask is, Karen asks, how did you find your fortune in the Caribbean exactly? Seems like everybody was plundering and pillaging and even not being a soldier. Well, you you see many different groups and and please anybody who is more who is more well versed about this can answer and and give some opinions on the chat, please do. But um, you can see different groups of people that come to the Caribbean. Some are the um, indentured servants. Uh, people who have a great um, depth and they pretty much give themselves as collateral and they come to work for free until their debt is paid uh, one way or another. The other one is uh, people who have no way to continue growing financially or socially in the countries of origin and therefore, you know, they find uh, the prospect of the Caribbean as a place where they could potentially get rich as some uh, several people did you know they, they came to the Caribbean without a penny and eventually they became very wealthy the other group were the people who were enslaved they had no decision on the matter the other cool group were the military and the other group were people who were really wealthy and they were entrepreneurs and they had a very clear uh, sense of ambition and what they wanted to accomplish so that's how you uh, found your luck and your fortune in the Caribbean uh, not all of them were able to do so. Obviously, the enslaved people were not able to do that, but uh, the other ones had a good chance. Uh, now, one thing about um, the Stacia, and I want to go back to what I said about how it was the perfect place for this to happen. Stacia was a very cosmopolitan place. Um, it was a place where there were all kinds of people, all kinds of backgrounds, all kinds of religions, all kinds of, uh, it, it was it was a melting pot of, of cultures. And, and so and I, I would like, if you allow me to make a comment that I find fascinating. Um, when you look at New York, New York City, New York City, and you look at the rest of the United States, is a very clear distinction, but it all goes back hundreds of years ago when New York City was originally Dutch. So for a period of time, it had Dutch culture where, you know, like uh, women were equal, uh, there was a melting pot of cultures, there was a lot more of religious tolerance and very cosmopolitan, as opposed to British, uh, the British culture that ended up taking the rest of the United States. Now the British, ended up taking over uh, uh, New York. It went from New Amsterdam to New York. However, while the name changed and the hands changed, the culture really didn't. And even now, that Dutch culture has remained for so long. And that is why New York City is so different from the rest of the United States. I agree. (laughs) I say that as somebody who works in a Delancey house, that was originally bought by the Van Cortlands and has a Dutch tie to it. There you go. I am going to wrap this up with one last question that is always my favorite to ask. If you can eat dinner at Francis Tavern with anybody in history, who would it be and why? I'm going to end up taking the whole floor. Ah, all right. (laughs) It's a dinner party, my friend. The dinner party. But, but yeah, there, there are a lot of people that I, that I find uh, absolutely fascinating. And um, a lot of them are from the very old history periods and uh, a couple of modern people, if you will. But uh, from the modern side, I would definitely have three people, uh, Nikola Tesla, Isaac Newton, and Mr. Rogers. Um, and from the history, side, I would have uh, Alexander Hamilton, Chanakya. Um, I would have definitely George Washington, Governor Morris. And, uh, yeah. 
And uh, I'm going to stop there because otherwise there's another going to be an end to this uh, conversation. I got to tell you, I love that table and I'd love to sit it on Mr. Rogers talking to everybody because I think that would be beautiful. Yeah. Well, thank you again, Sergio. You can reach out and learn more about the AHA Society. Sarah has dropped the link of their website below. Thank you again for this wonderful presentation. It's always a pleasure. This was super informative. And again, thank you to Walter for supplementing all of that information. That was absolutely wonderful. And Michael. Yes, and Michael, of course, of course. Yes, you guys were the real like MVPs of the chat tonight. So we really do appreciate it. So thank you all. We hope you have a wonderful night and we hope to see you again. My pleasure. Thank you so much for everybody for, for joining. Good, Good night, night, everybody.